to the Future, the podcast where dreamers and achievers talk to musician and writer Fuchsia Flox. My guest today on the show is Warren Hewitt. He's an English record producer, musician, composer and recording engineer based in Los Angeles, California. He's also a multi-platinum producer for bands such as The Fray, James Blunt, Aerosmith, The Ramones and Korn, to name but a few. He's also the owner of Spitfire Studios and YouTube channel Produce Like a Pro. Welcome to the podcast, Warren. Thank you ever so much for having me. I really appreciate it. My first question, of course, is, did you have a childhood dream? Yeah, I mean, it was always, it, it was always the arts. Um, I know that sounds a little grandiose, but my father was, unfortunately, my father died a couple of years ago, but he was a painter and a sculptor. Everything about my upbringing was arts-based, and there was paintings all over the house, there was sculpture. So it was a very creative household, you know, between the painting and the sculpture and, and the music. Nobody in my family, as far as I know, actually played music before me. Maybe they did going back a few generations, but not my parents or my grandparents. However, the love of music was insane. Um, I don't know if it's an age thing or not, but, uh, you know, I grew up with classical music being played all the time. And then, I mean, like consistently. And then um, jazz and some kind of rock pop stuff. So I love the song that you recorded recently and had up online about your wife, Cassia. When did you first pick up an instrument and think, this is for me? Well, when I was... I think I was seven. Um, Same here, it, it, snap. Yeah, but I didn't start playing then. So what happened? It was a weird one. So I was seven years old and it was Christmas and my dad gave me a night at the opera. And wow. he handed it to me and said, this is worthy. <laughs> like, you know, this is something that it's okay for you to listen to, you know. Um, Quality. Yeah, because yeah. it fits in with all of this great classical music and jazz that we're playing, you know. Um, and like I said, it was it was nonstop every day. I had a fairly strict father, um, and I think sometimes, without going on to too much of a famous Warren tangent, <laughs> I think it's sometimes it's hard for people to relate. Maybe in America, but you might be able to understand if coming from the UK. Is like my family were incredibly, you know, liberal. They were into the arts, music, painting. I mean, I went to Covent Garden as a kid. You know, I experienced all of these things, so opera and everything, and super artsy background. But my father was also very strict. I think right. many people sort of assume strictness comes with, like, ultra-conservatism. It wasn't at all. My father was just very, very strict. So <laughs> like, do you think that discipline that your dad kind of instilled in you and that kind of quest for quality has helped you as a producer i do i think that it, it, it's sort of a catch-22 isn't it because um i love artistry and if you are an incredible artist you don't have to be a technician and that's something i learned even though i was listening to classical music and jazz because i was surrounded with arts you know i realized that you know great art my father was a realist but we would go to galleries and we would still love Van Gogh and and Monet and Manet and and all of the great painters. Yeah, yeah. Inski, you know, he would love all of that stuff. Mm. And none of that, especially artists like Kandinsky, would adhere to classic kind of technical ability. So I learned through an arts background that it wasn't all just about like, you know, because I almost feel like there's an obsession. I talk about this a lot, an obsession with technique at the moment because it's easier to teach. It's easier to teach a technical than it is to teach creativity. Yeah, interesting, and, uh, yeah. And so, which is, I think, a very, it's a thing you notice when you grow up in the UK, then you move to America. So you know in the UK, you know, our charts and is, is very driven by change. You know, music just was is continually evolving and changing, and then you move to America and you had like whole decades of, of barely any change in, in music. I remember as a kid watching, in fact, this is good for anybody who wants to watch the, the Sex Pistols movie, it's called The Filth and the Fury. They, they go to America, and I think it's like 77 or something like that, mm -hmm. and they have, on tonight's show, we have K. 
Kansas and these guys with long hair and a beard in like 1977, the Sex Pistols, and then like Ario Speedwagon, and like it's, it really does show the kind of difference in 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 uh, you know I'm looking at these pictures and I'm thinking to myself that band looks like 1968 <laughs> or 1967, but it's 1977, <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. But having said that, you know. Um, African American black music in America moves so quickly and yeah, evolves. Yeah, Motown. So- Motown blows my Mo- mind. Yeah, Motown, soul, the jazz, the funk, disco, everything. I mean, um, you know, I feel like you know Al- what I'm waiting for, Warren. I'm waiting for Quentin Tarantino to write a Motown script with the soundtrack. It would just be so awesome. <laughs> yeah, it needs somebody because they've tried so many times, haven't they? They did the Hendrix movie, and it was the poor thing was. Um, the poor thing was sort of hindered because um, they didn't get all the permission from the Hendrix estate to use all the music. Oh. Um, you, you know, the, these, the, the Bowie movie, I think, had the same problem, didn't it? Uh, and so if they can get a, a director as respectable and artistic as Quentin Tarantino yeah. to, to do that, I agree. I think That's, on my, that's on my, like, dream, you know, we're talking about dreams. That's on my dream wish list. So, Warren, you were in the band Star 69, after answering oh, yes. an ad in the Melody Maker, which was a British music magazine, what instrument were you playing at the time, and what aspirations did you have? What was your kind of dream, or did you even have one? The reality was is like I'm trying to think of a, a, a right way of saying this, so and I don't want to be pompous, but I'm a, you know I'm a good guitar player, a really good guitar yeah. player. I I learned how to quote unquote shred. You know I can play really really well, which is good. But in the, but here we are in the mid '90s when that happened, and that was not that was not a thing that we wanted you know i had grown up listening to queen obviously as we're talking about you know night at the opera yeah. i had because of the classical upbringing i loved a lot of the progressive rock stuff of the late 60s and early 70s and so i listened to some of you know genesis and um king crimson and then i crossed over into more like hard rock but at the same time i loved blues i lo- like really obsessed over blues and awesome. jazz I think R&B. you have to. You have to obsess a bit over blues if you want to be a good guitar player. I agree. I agree entirely. So for me, I, I, I felt like a really well-rounded musician. And, um, and like I was saying earlier, it was all about feel, interpretation and less and the creativity. Um, but I still wanted to be able to like do Alan Holdsworth thrums. So I still was learning all this legato kind of techniques and all of these kind of things. And then, you know, I had I was a teenager in the 80s. So, you know, I'm coming up through the 80s as a teenager. I'm playing in my first few bands. And then, you know, late teens, early 20s, mid 90s, I'm suddenly like, oops. You know, Why it's great. That, well, I'm like 19, 20 years old. And I'm, you know, being able to do all this <laughs> stuff and play jazz and funk. And I toured in jazz bands and funk bands and wow. done all the things I did. You know, I've done great stuff. And, and, you know, as a working musician in England, I was doing everything I possibly could. You know, I was going, I was playing one-off shows in, in American air bases in Germany with like funk bands. And it was so much fun. As a musician in the UK, especially like mid-90s, um, as I'm sort of starting to establish myself, you just do what you have to do to get paid, which means you're playing like in club bands. I did the club bands in the north of England. As a teenager, I was super young. I was like 16 years old playing in these club bands. I was too young to get into the clubs and the pubs. But oh, I was just my kind of, goodness. And doing like touring in vans and playing shows. So I do, you know, we, we'd have like three or four shows a week. So you we have put, like, you've put in the graft, I mean, musically, professionally, like getting that kind of groundwork and going out there and doing live stuff. Yeah, it's it's a huge part, I think, of what, you know, what, what has shaped me. And, and I wouldn't change it for the world. I mean, I've done... I've played Reading Rock Festival, you know, um, I've done Ross Kilder, I've done all of these huge things and uh, mixed in with like doing a ton of clubs and pubs and, you know, American air bases in Germany, um, casinos, you know, we played, I played in a funk band uh, between bingo sets, you know, I've done it all. And that's what anybody of, of, of my age who came up in the sort of 80s and 90s as a musician, particularly the 90s, had to do. So when we got signed in 95, you know, to a, to a record deal, and it wasn't my first record deal, but it was my first record deal that probably, you know, got some level of success. When we signed in 95, 
you know, I was still scraping by doing those kinds of gigs. It doesn't seem and, fair, does it? When you have that kind of passion and enthusiasm and you're putting in like 110% and you're still kind of strapped for cash. It's. I wouldn't change it for the world. I, honestly, Emma, I wouldn't change it for the world. It's like such a big part of what makes me... I didn't do the thing many British musicians do, the kind of going through music college, music school. Right. But my, fa- my father was very much like you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You know, great artists with don't only give up. a handful of sessions <laughs> don't go to schools. So don't worry about it. It's tougher maybe in some ways, but I'm glad that I did it is what I'm trying to say. I'm yeah. glad that I did all of those things, you know. Yeah, sometimes the journey is really hard, but it makes you what you are. I know that sounds like a real cliche, but it's also so true. You know, the trial of the samurai sword by being folded seven times in fire you know, yep. it makes you tougher, it makes you more determined. And I think it separates the wheat from the chaff. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's... It separates I, the people who really want it, you know, who really want to succeed at what they do. But, you know, a lot of this stuff, when we talk about these uh, these kinds of journeys is, and I don't know, because as a listener, I hear guys like me talking and I, I have to sort of qualify something that I find missing in a lot of these 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 uh, discussions is that most of it was sort of osmosis, mentoring by osmosis, mentoring by experience. There's less aha moments. Mm-hmm. I can definitely point to my father saying this is worthy and letting me, frankly, at seven years old, experience amazing rock and roll music, rock music from Queen. And that was a huge moment because he made it a big deal. Mm-hmm. And, and so... It was definitely an aha moment and no, nothing will ever take that away from me. And it was the beginning of my musical journey. But the rest of these incredible experiences I have are just kind of, you know, they're, they're compounded and become something amazing. It must have been incredibly useful meeting and networking with people in the music industry and being in a studio working with producers, for example, when you were in Star 69. When did you first decide producing professionally could be your job? Well, I realised that you know, one of the things, going back to being so young, getting into music, one of the things you realize as you get older, quite bluntly, is I fell in love with music and, and, and the artistry of it before all of the usual reasons why guys get into bands, why men get into bands, quite frankly. It's like, yeah, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I, I was already obsessed with music. So the other side of the glass... Mm-hmm makes perfect sense to me because I just want to be in music. I, honestly, I do like playing live. It was a lot of fun playing in bands. I definitely embraced it and stuff like that. But it wasn't really – I'm not that kind of dude, you know what I mean? I wasn't always like, yeah, baby, you know what I mean? I just <laughs> loved being in bands and making music. So lots of, of, of people that end up in production are very similar kind of you know, people. A lot of my friends are at least because we just wanted to stay involved. And yeah be involved and creating music and and I work with so many solo artists or 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 bands that need my assistance and I can co-write with I can play the instruments on that it scratches all of those itches I mean Perfect. it's it, it it really is and then you know the educational side is just a natural thing because I, when I started doing produce like a pro I realized first of all when I started doing it there was no monetary gain you know there was no real advantage in doing it i know now every week there's a new youtube channel springing up you know doing paid reviews and selling courses and stuff like that and i get it you know it's a way for a lot of people that can't make any money to make money when i started produce like a pro seven years ago it was my busiest ever year and i was making really really good money and i still had like you know it was only two or three years after doing aerosmith and james blunt and all of these big artists but my you know, it might sound a little too altruistic, but I just wanted to, I went onto YouTube, I saw that the necessarily the quality wasn't necessarily that good, but I also saw a real gap in people that, that had come up like me, not through a college system, you know, and not from having like uh, loads of, you know, family connections and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, I'm a good example of what we have to do these days. Yeah. The way I grew up, making music and building a studio and owning all this expensive equipment was from literally just working my butt off. And so I thought to myself, if I can show people that, I can help them and let them know that even when it was much tougher to come up in an industry that was such a closed shop, I was able to do it. 
you know, it was definitely a, a labor and still continues to be a labor of love. I'm still balancing stuff. You know, I'm finishing up Mark Martel's record. Um, I'm mixing an album. I am, um, yeah, I'm always, I'm just working. I'm always doing like eight projects and trying to do all the educational stuff. <laughs> Fantastic. You recorded the phrase self-titled second album, which debuted at number one on the Billboard charts. What is it like working with bands like The Fray? I have a lot of affinity with them as people. Um, Isaac, I admire greatly. Some of the stories I've told privately, I'll, I'll tell you. So, for instance, when we were doing the second Fray record, we were in Sausalito for about three months on the initial part of the record. And we would go, hey, let's meet at the uh, breakfast joint. And they had this huge table. So it was like a, you know, I suppose what we call like a family style breakfast thing. We'd all sit around and have breakfast. So for about three months, two or three times a week, we would do that. And every single time we would do it, Isaac would be missing. And by, <laughs> and by the end of the breakfast, he would show up with like a teenage boy, like maybe 18, 19 years old, something like that. And he would introduce and say, here's my friend, John. Here's my friend, uh, you know, George. Here's my friend, you know, Chad, Buck, whatever their name was. Yeah. And I want to paint a little bit of a picture. This is second album. This is after selling four million albums. He's wow. the main songwriter in the band. He's not poor. He's doing really well. They've done massive world tours. And just to, you know, to give some perspective here. And then, you know, I think about third or fourth time, I asked him. I asked him, like, hey, I see, you, you know, you're bringing these, these kids um, and introducing them to them. And uh, he was doing the Big Brother program. Oh, so fantastic. So he was flying these kids in. Oh, man. He was help mentoring them because they all came from, like, broken homes one guy actually came in quite often when we were and actually became a friend and came to a lot more of our sessions. And, um, you know, some, some were in foster homes. Some that is had, amazing. Yeah. So he's doing this while making his second album and he, taking his free time to do it. So, you know, I have a lot of, to say I have a lot of respect for Isaac and, and it would be the understatement of the decade. Yeah, that's and, like a real life hero. That's someone that's just really making, like just increasing their legacy in such a beautiful way. Yeah. And I used to like read reviews of the albums we would make and, and, and like all these kind of these critics would, like launch into them and like say that, you know, this is an honest sounding and stuff. And it was really unusual because Isaac was always writing about real life experiences. How to save a life is a real life experience. There's a song on the second album called Enough for Now, mm. which is a combination of experiences with his with his mother who grew up uh, after his parents divorced and the experience of seeing another family with a new, with the father's new family and experiencing that mixed in with, um, you know, him helping kids. Um, there was a girl who was battling bulimia. She came in and that they were all around and they were having like these group meetings. And that was the phrase that just came up like enough is enough. Yeah. That's enough. Now. Yeah. You know, you've got to change your habit. We've got to, got to get you healthy. So, you know, these are like real songs that really meant something. And they, it's interesting. I, I feel like, but it, it comes one. across in the music, like How to Save a Life. I listened to that at kind of a bleak period in my life and it just, it struck me, it struck a chord, it got to me, it spoke to me. And th I think that's why bands like The Fray are so successful. They speak to people. So I'm going to ask you this question. Yeah. See, because I, I feel like, you know, using affinity again, all of the bands and the artists that I tend to love are particularly at the time, Queen are a great example, mm. the Fray are a example. The bands that I actually love are absolutely destroyed by critics. Like Queen were never a popular band with critics. With Real People, one of the biggest bands, possibly the biggest band in the world, mm. Fray at that, at that time was selling millions and millions of records or even being destroyed by critics. And yet both of them have such an honesty. I mean, now, of course, in this sort of uh, world we live in where people are going back and looking looking at preconceived ideas. I mean, obviously, everybody's now looking and seeing Freddie and realizing what an incredible icon he was, not just as a singer, but the things that he overcame mm -hmm. and the positiveness and, and, the, and the role model he is for so many people is so huge. Yeah. And, and you look at Isaac and uh, there's there's a guy that just – put himself last on a, on a very long list to help people. I think we still, we live in an amplified culture of popularism, obviously, um, whether it be politics, whether it be like the YouTube or the teaching world, people like 
wagging their fingers and telling people off and everybody's like ranting and it's cool to, <laughs> cool to be angry. It's cool to do a video of like, this sucks. <laughs> yeah. It will give you a million views if you say something sucks and put your head in your head. If it's controversial. I cannot, yeah. I cannot be that person. I want to celebrate the beauty in what we do. You know, it's and people are completely fair weather, aren't they? You know, I grew up queen with my band. I actually love it. And yet it's it's like they, they were never called to like. But now, of course, they're called to like because we all go back and realize people realize, you know, like I said a minute ago, you know, how iconic Freddie was and just how many barriers he broke down. And, you know, I mean, to be the greatest rock singer that ever lived and be so openly gay and how it destroyed his career in America at the time. It when, was very brave. <laughs> absolutely. And the fact that we can, like, look at him now and just be like, Wow. I mean, you can do anything. Did you ever think, Warren, or realise that your dream and your passion for music and production, um, your belief in things like quality and honesty and striking a chord would help others achieve their dreams? Yeah, I, I often get asked about produce like a pro, like our academy. Or other YouTubers say to me, oh, why do you spend all your time answering comments? You know. Because you go to all the, the biggest channels, there are to like one or two, and they'll star the comment that says that they're a genius and it they can't believe it. It makes them so happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They reinforce the, the ego and like, you know, you're a genius. I can't believe that you told me, you know, something I already know, you know, reinforce my opinions. I, so I, therefore I love you, you know, rather than challenging ideas, you know. I get it. You know, we live in a populist society. We live we live in a society where it's dominated by one age group at the moment. And so we're going to be obsessed with certain genres of music and certain political events. And we're going to be talking about that, you know, until the, the next generation takes over, which will be us, the Gen Xers. But anyway, I, I wanted to create, and I still do, a playground that I could play in. To me, it's like when I was at school, there was all the wagging fingery kind of you know geniuses that knew right and were telling everybody off and all that kind of stuff i mean they're they're they're, they're in a way they're bullies you know they mm -hmm. are um reinforcing popularist ideas and they're they're bullying us and i think that i wanted to create produce like a pro where a bunch of crazy artistic people of any age could come together and talk about how to record and write music and just kind of feel safe yeah. And not feel like there is only one way. Yeah. And, you know. Your, your Produce Like a Pro YouTube channel is, it really is amazing. Your videos and live broadcasts help with every aspect of recording and engineering and producing and the technical properties involved in having your own home-based studio, which is fantastic. I know it's got over 50 million views and over 550,000 subscribers. I found it very useful. It helped me get my songs onto BBC Radio and Indie Radio. And things were okay. like side chaining, you know, stuff that before just made my brain freeze have become kind of understandable. And so is that why you did it? Just to help other people? Yep. I mean, entirely. I mean, we, we, we have a membership fee, but it's it's low. We keep it low. We want to get people in. We want to get people helping each other. You know, I'm pretty transparent about that stuff. It To, to me, it's like, you know, do what you love and make money as a consequence. So I, I, I don't know if it's the... Maybe it's that classic kind of uh, British thing that we do. We like the underdog. We've always like cheering that on. We want to take somebody that doesn't have the advantages and be like, yeah. Yeah, so I just wanted to create a place where we all feel safe. Right. You know, where we can all we can all be the underdogs or whatever, you know. Um, because when I was a kid at school, you know, there was like three or four stupidly artsy kids like me. And, and I used to walk around with an AM radio that my grandfather had given me because you know we didn't have any money so i didn't have a walkman or anything fancy like that so i had the am radio with the with the mono earbud that you would put in and i would just listen to you know the lowest quality you know you'd listen to like you know ding, 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 you know like yeah, little tiny tinny. bit right yeah yeah and i would sit in classes when i was supposed to be studying you know listening to music <laughs> try and hide it under my hair you know i got, I got caught a couple of times but you know, music and, and arts is just like it's it, it you know how it is it's like when it's in you it's it's the only thing that you care about and yeah and you can't really escape it either if it's in you that's you know you have to in the end you know something will jump start you or if you're kind of avoiding being an artist it, w it will get you in the end if 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 you're meant to be that thing yeah 
So the music industry has a high rate of rejection. Were you ever tempted to pack it all in or did your talent and belief just keep you going and progressing? Did I ever think about packing it in? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's one of those things. I mean, you, I, I, I never stopped. I never, ever stopped. But um, I think I went through that thing. You know, I left home at 16. Um, the, I went to Basingstoke Tech and I did my foundation in art. You know, I had some setbacks. I, you know, I think in the back of my mind, I, was, I just started playing guitar at 16 years old. I was playing all the time. I was doing, I was painting all the time. I was drawing all the time. Wonderful. I, I was doing this foundation in art. You know, my father was like, you know, you've got, you've got to do what you've got to do. And at the same time, you know, music, I couldn't escape it. You know, I just could not escape it. So yeah. when I did get into the university I was applying for, again, a year or two too soon, so it was not surprising I didn't get in. But when I didn't, uh, when I didn't get in, and being the impatient sixteen-year-old that you can, be, <laughs> I decided I'm going to start playing in bands, you know, full time, and that was it. You know, I, I was already playing in bands, but I was I, I added like the professional element, you know, which means playing in pubs and clubs and getting paid for it. So it was a lot of covers gigs. But I moved to the north of England, and I would play the band I played in. We played covers. And we also played original material. And the thing was, I love this story. I've told this story a few times, and I'm going to tell you. I remember being in Carlisle in the north of England, and I worked part-time in this uh, music store called Northern Sounds. Mm -hmm. It's no longer there, unfortunately. It's on, on Botchergate for anybody in Carlisle who remembers Botchergate. <laughs> and I'm working in this store, and the manager was like three years older than me, you know, a whopping three years. But when you're like <laughs> 16, 17, that seems like a – Eternity. I remember yeah. he was like 19, 20, like so old. And he would play piano and scat sing. And it was an absolutely phenomenal musician. And I remember at the time, and he would, he would bring out sheet music and sing and play like that. Like perfect pitch, would sing, sing the lyrics, sing the melody, play the parts as uh. written. Like <laughs> absolutely perfect. But I remember at the time, and this is just kind of like the circumstance that you grow up in. And one of the main reasons, one of the driving reasons why I started Produce Like a Pro, I'll explain a little bit more. So, so there he is. He's like 19, 20 years old. He's this phenomenal keyboard player, sight reader, perfect pitch, great improviser, all of the things. And I remember at the time thinking, well, Nick, his name was Nick. And I remember thinking, Nick's really good, but I bet you like in L.A. or New York, there's like 20 of him. Like, and they're probably all better than him. I'm telling you, to this day, I've never met a better keyboard player, with the exception of somebody like Jeff Lorber, who I'm actually going to see this afternoon. Oh, I, ho like, I, I hope he hears that, Nick. Well, I've told him that many times, but, you know, it's 30 years ago. 30 years ago, with no internet, with no produce like a pro, nothing like that where people could, could get together and share ideas. That's my point. At 19, 20 years old, if he had been taken under the... Uh, somebody taking him under his wing, he'd be one of those guys. Yeah. We'd be talking about him as one of the great jazz jazz piano players. It's getting recognition, uh, isn't it, from someone who has a little bit of kind of impetus or power in the industry? Yeah. I never really got that myself. It was just what it is is a it's a case of chipping away, of like continually chipping away, chipping away, chipping away. It, it, it is a tough industry to be successful in. Uh, especially coming up in the 90s where it was all about the money. You know, CD sales were through the roof. You get bands with like, um, would have like top 40 hits on indie radio and sell a million albums. You know, it was a very different kind of world. 60s, 70s and even the 80s where you'd have to have massive songs to be able to sell platinum records. Mm. When I moved to LA in the mid late nineties, bands could have hits on K Rock and these kind of indie indie rock stations and get platinum records, sometimes even double platinum records. And bands that now you could barely remember the name of or even sing the song back. And that's it, it was a very, very weird industry in, to be involved in in the nineties where the money was so massive and you know, you know, Alanis Morissette, she sold twenty five million albums in a couple of years. And she's incredible. But, you know, Aretha Franklin has not sold 25 million records of That's any one album. That's a crime. <laughs> yeah. 
but it just tells you what the industry was like in the 90s. So you've got these massively successful people, um, and not just artists, you know, the producers and the engineers and mixers. In that period of like 95 to like 2005, that 10 year space, and you can move a year either side, people were making incredible amounts of money. I remember a, a, a somebody mixed my album um, as an artist in like 97, turning up every single day with a different supercar to the studio. Oh, whoa. You know, and that was from being a mixer. You know, it was a totally different world um, to what came before and what came afterwards. Yeah. Um, so it's an interesting thing for people that are old enough, like Jack Douglas and stuff like that. He'll tell you albums he worked on, some of the biggest records of all time, no, biggest, most successful records, important records. Some of them were gold and platinum, maybe double platinum. Um, and there he is in the 70s making some of the seminal, important albums, you know, with the New York Dolls and bands like that that barely went gold. Wow. What advice would you give to musical dreamers out there in this day and age? I think the most important thing for an artist is to put their art first, but also understand that it is commerce. And it's such a difficult balance. Mm. Honestly, one of the biggest lessons I learned from my father was to correct some of the things that he didn't do very well. To be really blunt, he was an incredible painter, a great sculptor who just got by selling things here and there and probably didn't improve his art because he didn't get any validation or success during his lifetime. So he was unable to, you know, you get guys like Jeff Beck as a guitar player. You know, he continually evolved because he was getting the validation and, and the right, success. Right. Without that, for a lot of artists, it's really, really tough. I had a girlfriend many, many, many years ago who was telling me about her father and, and what a great guitar player she, he was. And she played me some stuff he had recorded in the 80s, and it was phenomenal. But by the time I got to meet him in like the early 2000s, he was just kind of plonking around and barely playing. And I felt really bad because I could hear somebody who was amazing and had the potential, but life had not been kind to him yeah. music. Yeah. So he pushed himself. But then you look at a guy like Jeff Beck, who always has been one of the most important guitar players that ever lived, and he's getting validation. He's getting guys like us talking about how talented he is, and he, can, he can't turn from people at recognizing his sheer talent. So I think that's that's one of those things. It's like how do we how do we maintain that? I mean, as an artist, you've got to be able to balance your art with enough commerce, and waiting for people to come to you isn't going to work you have to get yourself out there i couldn't agree you know, more yeah i say to people all the time i'm like well how do people find your music you know and it, and they'll be really obscure they'll tell me that it, they've been unlucky but they're not helping themselves you know <laughs> yeah so it's a tough one you know any cringe awkward moments in your music career oh god i mean tons we were in sunset sound three days ago and David Crosby was recording there and my musicians that we hired were, were talking to him and they're incredible players. And I just was like, this is the most awkward thing in the world. I've got to walk up to David Crosby, say hi and pull my musicians back into the studio so we can keep tracking because there were session players being paid. And it's like, you don't want to do it. Yeah. Every day is fraught with those kinds of dangers. <laughs> That's more like professional producer professionalism, I think. Yeah. Still completely awkward. You're always bouncing and you're always, you're always moving between those kinds of things. And when I tell people, like, you know, I can be blunt, I don't think it's, uh, there's ever any malice in it, but I do, I do think that you have to sort of cut to the chase. You know, our business is driven by fads and trends, as you know. Um, and so, you know, I think the, the great thing that's happened in the last few years is I've started to gravitate and work with some of the most amazing artists you know working with mark martel has been an absolute blessing because he's an insane singer absolutely insane and so i can i can i can ask things of him that i can't get from 99 percent of other people and it's been a real pleasure but then i work with other people that may not necessarily have the technique that he has but they have so much to say you know, creatively and emotionally, that it makes up for all of those things. Yeah. Are there are there any tips um, you can give to other producers out there who might be learning or, you know, starting to think of making their own studio? 
Do you ever decline work from certain artists? And if so, what are your standards for artists being in the studio? So I got an email this morning, and this is sort of typical. And it's from it's from an artist, an uh, artist slash producer who is interested in, in me helping. And it's it's like six pages long. And the difficulty is, is like, you know, it's my job to get in there and understand people. But if if they haven't quite got an understanding of themselves, sometimes that can be really, really difficult. And uh, especially if they're still sort of trying to figure out, you know, what they want. I think one of the things that makes it difficult for artists is like when you read the six six pages of email, you also realize that there's a combination of um, – they might not know who they are as an artist yet. Yeah. Also combined with the fact that you can read that they aren't necessarily going to trust you either. They're looking for a magic bullet. It's a lot of problems without any solution-based thinking. And that's that isn't that many people. But if I'm if I get if I get artists like that where you can see the writing on the wall and you're like, we're not going to get, you know, something great. One of the things that I've learned, and it's interesting, and I still continually learn, and I have to be reminded of consistently, you know, I, I, I did some partnerships with different people over the years, and when you work with somebody that basically has a problem with everybody they've ever worked with, you start looking at it going, oh, wait there, I'm going to be the next person they have a problem with, you know? And uh, it's... That that's a difficult thing as well, because I know artists are looking for somebody that can really get inside their mind and help them. And that's something I pride myself on. But they have but to have a kind of roadmap for their workers already, don't they? They have to kind of to want a, to know where they're going with it. Absolutely. I also feel like they they also need to be open to collaborate with others. And that's I think, is one of the biggest things that um, I. Oh, that's interesting. Biggest, uh, that's interesting. Yeah, and if I'm if I'm getting a six page email which just talks about really how they're not they're not sort of like you know they're not really fully understanding uh, themselves, but they're also telling me how all of these other people don't understand them, um, especially when there's a couple of names in there maybe of people I know that are really talented and really care about artists. Yeah, it's a bit concerning. I think that as an artist you have to balance being really forthright on what your message and who you are is. And sticking to it, yeah. Sticking to it, but also yeah. being willing to collaborate with others as well. Do you have any dreams for yourself for the future? I want to um, grow what we're doing here into something that's sort of bigger than any one person. Um, the, 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 the teaching side is none of it has my name on it um, because it's not about me. And I have a lot of people that we've been sort of working with and developing, and it's really important to me to bring in other voices. Um, for instance, I'll tell you, nobody else knows. I don't know where this is coming out, but Maria Ayerbe, who's a good friend of mine, um, who's an incredible uh, Latino um, um, producer, engineer, and mixer, she's doing videos for Produce Like a Pro in Spanish. So um, it's a whole part of the community that gets ignored. And it's like the third biggest language in the world after, you know, Mandarin, English and Spanish are like the three biggest languages in the world. Actually, I don't know the exact order. It might be the second biggest language in the world. Sorry. But we have Kato Zane, who she used to she used to be on this channel called Pro Studio Live, which um, was on YouTube for a while, and she did really well on that. She's going to be doing some videos for us. And the bigger vision for me um, and collaborating with other channels and stuff is to really make it not about me um, because the channel grew with me giving tips and tricks, but I really don't want Produce Like a Pro um, to be associated with just one person and any one fixed idea. I mean, one of the things I think that confuses the audience and also makes them very happy is that I move between maybe, well, let's have a look. What was our, what was our last video with Mark Daniel Nelson taught uh, some tips and tricks. We had blues rock guitar player, Jared James on two days ago. Yeah. I saw that one. We had a drum miking video. 
Then we had a discussion on Atmos, which is a huge thing for us to talk about because it's a growth industry for producing. Then we did ABBA, and then we had Yuri, some plug-in stuff, then Bob Marley. Then we had our good friend Addy, who's traveling um, around North Africa and the Middle East recording artists. Basically, there's no one genre. From a personal perspective, Produce Like a Pro is just so useful, so helpful, and it's very accessible. You know, speaking as somebody who's had to learn everything from scratch about six or seven years ago, I didn't know Pro Tools, I didn't know the first thing about producing. It has been my number one go-to. So I think it's fabulous that you're going to expand into different languages. It's really great. Well, you rock. This has been an absolute pleasure, Emma. Warren, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Thanks, Emma. I really appreciate it. That was the marvellous Warren Hewitt speaking from Los Angeles. You can follow him on all the usual social media, Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. I really recommend that you check out his Produce Like a Pro website at www.producelikeapro.com. This isn't a paid endorsement. I'm a genuine fan. It's a really useful and educational site for newbies in music and producing and advanced technicians alike. I can also recommend his tutorial videos with music industry pros like Chris Lord, Bob Marlette, Mark Needham and Ulrich Wilde. I'm now going to play one of my own songs, written, played and produced by me here at home. This is You Move My Way. You can follow me, Fuchsia Flocks, on my social media, subscribe to any of my channels, or check out my website, fuchsiaflocks.wixsite.com slash fuchsia. You can download my music on iTunes, Apple Music, Amazon and Spotify, and on all good online music retailers. You can find all my books for adults and children on Amazon. 
If you want to donate to your favourite charity at the same time for no extra price, you can get my books on smile.amazon.co.uk. Do what makes you happy. Be true to yourself. (laughs) 